properties in the Northwest Minerals Province. So welcome. Uh, my name is Rick Valenta. I'm the director of the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Center at the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland. And our panelists today are uh, Dan Thomas, managing director of Hammer Metals, uh, Helen Dejeling, director of Minerals Geoscience Geological Survey of Queensland, Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy, Queensland, Anita Parbarka Fox, uh, who is a senior research fellow at the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland, and Stephen Micklethwaite, who's an exploration manager and adjunct associate professor at Monash University. Um, and before we get going, what I wanted to mention was that if you have questions, um, please type them into the chat function on the lower right hand side, and, uh, and we'll do our best to get to them in the next half an hour or so. Uh, so my first question is for Dan Thomas. Um, and, and the question is, Dan, how important has it been to be able to access funding from the Queensland government and from JOGMEC to continue your exploration in the Northwest Mineral Province? And why do you think they chose to fund Hammer amongst all the competition? Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, it's been really invaluable. I think for a company like Hammer, we've had a presence now in Mount Isa for many years. I'm um, in a current form about six years. I think as a junior company with our investors, we have a very um, short life cycle or window to capture their attention, typically two or three seasons of exploration. I think as everyone knows, the exploration process can take decade longer sometimes. It's not as short as we'd like it to. And I think you probably end up with a small company, a relatively small budget, two, three million dollars per annum to get out there those two or three seasons to try and capture the that that news flow and that excitement that investors are looking for. And I think when you get out to a company like Hammer, we've been in the Mount Isa region, our current form for six years, I think investors get a little bit tired of the story. And I think the compounding factor for us is base metals haven't been the flavor of the month over the last 12 months. Um, investors have flocked to gold and precious metals. Um, for us to keep our project going and keep moving there, the funding from the likes of JOGMEC, the funding from the likes of the Queensland State Government through the CEI process, allows us to keep our projects moving. It allows us to take forward new ideas and new opportunities. So when the base metal sector turns again and investor interest flocks back to the copper story and what's potentially there from a copper perspective, critical minerals, um, natural, national supply bases for, for these elements, I think having done this work in this phase really brings us to the forefront of then attracting that next leg of funding into the project. Um, I think the reason that we got chosen by JOGMEC was um, they share our vision that we hold a potential for a large tier one scale discovery where we are in Mount Isa. The ground position we've picked up there has taken many years, um, accumulating, I guess, smaller holdings through the region. We've picked up two areas primarily focused on large fault structures through the region. Um, and JOGMEC share that view that we have a large, large scale tier one IOCG deposit to be found there. And we're drilling at the end of this week. So it's exciting. From a CEI perspective, how did we win funding? Um, I think the experience of the team, having spent many, many years in Mount Isa, Mark Whittle, um, Russell Davis have been through the region for many years. Um, they understand the process, they understand our opportunity. And I think having a good land holding across key structures, having lots of the um, different uh, metal potential through both copper and also some of these critical minerals, I think, um, especially addressing the criteria that the Queensland government has released and the renewed focus on critical minerals, tailoring our applications, making sure that our applications meet all the criteria spelt out through the documentation um, and having sound geological theory and applying innovative and new ways to be approaching these projects, I think has really, really enabled us to win some of that funding. Well, that's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, if you have some questions for Dan, after just he's just spoken. So if you've thought of a great question, type it in the chat function now, and then we'll try and get it get to it at the end. So I'm going to turn to you now, Helen. Um, and my question is around the uh, the program, the Strategic Resources Pro Exploration Program that's been running uh, the, um, for the last three years, three years into a four year schedule, and uh, it's really starting to produce some good results. So my question is, how important? is knowledge transfer, actually getting those results across to industry in that program. And how have you managed to maintain that in the last four months of lockdown? Um, that's a great question, Rick. Look, there's no point um, the government or academic institutions spending taxpayer money on 
promoting exploration, trying to generate new opportunities for explorers if that information, that data, uh, those ideas don't get out into industry. So knowledge transfer is a vitally important part of everything that we're trying to do. Um, and as, as Rick mentioned, we're coming to the, to the last 12 months of our strategic resources exploration program. And the real aim of that program was to boost and promote and generate new opportunities for in particular base metals exploration in the Northwest Minerals Province. Understanding that there's been, there's been a lot of work by a lot of different people, whether they're industry explorers, academics, government institutions, CSIRO surveys, um, over the last 20 years or so, and that hasn't translated into the giant uh, discoveries that you would think you would come off the back of that huge investment in, um, in R&D. So one of our theories for that is that there hasn't been adequate um, communication between those research, research bodies and, um, and industry partners or the mineral explorers in the region. So last year we embarked on a series of on the ground workshops um, in Mount Isa, Townsville, places like that, trying to engage with explorers and, and get them interacting with our data sets, um, hear from them what the issues are and, and really trying to facilitate in a much better way um, that knowledge transfer. Of course, any workshops that we might have had planned um, in the last few months had to be put on hold. So we've taken that uh, online and actually in collaboration with, with Rick Valenta um, at the University of Queensland, the GSQ and UQ have set out to present weekly webinars since April. Um, and the last one of those is actually this afternoon. So you can just Google UQ GSQ webinars and you'll find them. Um, and so that's, it's a crucial part of us being able to deliver information at a time when explorers may be desk bound. Traditional field activities might be a bit hampered and but they're still able to generate targets and get themselves set up for um, for when you know field activities resume. And I, and I know, I mean, Dan was saying they'll be drilling at the end of this week and, and that's absolutely fantastic. And I know quite a few people are up there in the Mount Isa Cloncurry region um, but, but some are still, you know, hampered by being unable to cross borders and, and such like. So being able to do some of that extra work that they wouldn't be able to do through having access to data, um, seeing what's new, having those discussions, I, I hope has been really valuable. And we certainly plan to continue that um, into the future. Great. Well, thanks very much, Helen. And again, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for Helen, um, Best time is to, you know, if you've just, if you've thought of them, type them in now and we'll, we'll try and get to them at the end of the, uh, at the end of the discussion. I now want to move on to, uh, to Steve Micklethwaite. Um, and, and Steve, my question for you is, you know, the largest portion of the Northwest Mineral Province lies under covered extensions. It's not the outcropping part. Um, so what opportunities do you think exist and what are the useful approaches to exploration of that particular land package? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, well, I mean, just from a pure logic perspective, the outcropping part of Mount Isa has several world-class deposits in it. Um, Mount Isa itself, obviously, and, and Ernest Henry are two really notable standouts. So it makes logic that if that is only occupying, say, 30% of the Northwest Minerals province, what what lies under the other 70%? There has to be equivalent sized deposits elsewhere in the region. So there's an incredible opportunity for um, discovery, uh, even though it's technically challenging. And you could call undercover exploration sort of the last pristine exploration opportunity we have in Australia. And, and it's an it's a, it's a opening frontier. Um, the nature of the challenge is is significant, um, and it's it, but it's it's once been done before. So the petroleum industry in the nineteen fifties and sixties moved from um, land based hydrocarbon exploration into the marine environment and then the deep marine environment, 
And, you know, that led to, that, that drove innovation, um, both in terms of drilling technology and in terms of their understanding of the systems. And likewise, we need to see that happening, and it is happening in our industry in the minerals now. So we have groups like Minex CRC who are trying to develop um, new drilling technology that might enable us to test um, through thick cover, but at a much at a fraction of the current cost of drilling, uh, drilling technology. Um, Helen already mentioned the data releases that are coming out of the surveys. Those things are, are absolutely invaluable. So the work that the survey in Queensland and that the Geoscience Australia themselves are doing has, is, is absolutely fantastic. It puts Australia at the forefront of exploration worldwide, gives us a, a level of pre-competitive data that you, you know, we could not possibly afford to collect ourselves if, if it wasn't there um, initially. And it gives you an, an ability to assess an area before you go into it, even when you know it's going to be technically challenging. But I think the other opportunities that are non-technical that are really worth mentioning here is if you go back a hundred years or more, the minerals industry was a source of massive rural income. You know, you had you had towns throughout West Australia and Queensland which have largely disappeared. And um, and now we recognise in this day and age um, that there is a possibility through the minerals industry to really rejuvenate our rural communities. And you know, we, Mount Isa itself is a case in point. We'd, we'd love to find the next big deposit in the vicinity of the Mount Isa town, so that that town can be can be sustained in, into the decades ahead. Um, but I think that, that, that the discourse can be even better than that, because mining leaves a lasting legacy, or can leave a lasting legacy. It can, it can um, bring training needs to local communities. It can bring power. It can bring connections, good connectivity to the internet. So we should really be thinking quite hard about um, what can we bring to the rural communities in these remote locations that will be of genuine benefit to the nation and to the environment um, through our activities. And I think that's um, something well worth pondering. And then the final thing I would just add to that is um, the opportunities lie in terms of driving innovation, in terms of finding a big deposit, in terms of rejuvenating communities. Um, it's worth just remembering that the, the transformation the petroleum industry went through in the 50s and 60s was driven by subsidies and taxation help. And if we're actually going to start exploring in undercover areas like we're trying to, that should be something that's considered um, because of just because of the sort of order of magnitude um, costs involved and, and encumbrance on companies in order to be successful in that ground. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Steve. Very interesting. Um, very interesting answer. And um, again, if you have any questions for Steve, um, please please type them into the box. I'm now going to move, you know, change, change gears quite a bit and move to Anita. Um, and and my question for you, Anita, is, um, you know, mine waste, it's not normally factored into plans for future resources in a meaningful way. Um, and so my question is really, what, what sort of potential for this, for, for obtaining future resources from mine waste, do you see or is being shown up by the work you've been carrying out in the Northwest Mineral Province? Thanks, Rick. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for your answers. It's been really interesting to, to, to hear your answers and your input. Um, yeah, the, this, since I've been um, working up in Queensland, um, there's obviously been a lot of opportunity here to actually look at mine waste uh, in terms of its economic prospectivity. So recently we've been undertaking a big program with uh, the GSQ, um, Helen and her team. We've actually gone out to a number of sites and we've undertaken mineralogical and geochemical studies to evaluate the potential for additional uh, resource recovery. So the, the sorts of things we're looking at, some of the non-traditional kind of metals. So, I mean, obviously, um, Queensland's been quite established for base metal mining and, and gold and other things. But what we're looking at in this particular project is some of the new economy metals. So we're looking at things like cobalt, we're looking at tungsten, we're looking at indium. And the opportunity we've got here is, is, is quite substantial. So uh, in, in the program that we've undertaken, um, as I've said, we've been out to a number of sites and you know we've we've developed kind of sampling campaigns where we've selected tailings 
wastefront materials, um, heat beach materials. And yeah, we've, we've had a good look at, at what's actually in that material. So the reason that's important to do is because obviously as, as um, it's kind of been touched upon, you know, if, um, if you leave this mine waste out in the environment, there's opportunities for environmental risk. So, you know, there's, there's obviously many global case studies which um, document the formation of acid mine drainage and the impact that has on the environment. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with mines, uh, you are obviously going to have a proportion potentially of sulfidic waste. And if that's left out in the environment, that will obviously oxidize and cause acid mine drainage. Um, so again, I guess basically what this is um, sort of helping to foster is a different approach towards waste. I mean, just as a global community, um, there's been more of a push towards kind of thinking in terms of circular economy. And, you know, I think a few years ago it was stated that the objective for the Australian government was to grow the circular economy industry. So it's about $26 billion industry. And so what mine waste sort of offers the opportunity for is to actually contribute to that overall figure of, of circular economy and revenue generation. So um, in Queensland, there's obviously a number of um, sites where we can work in terms of looking at mine waste characterization. And um, yeah, uh, in our program so far, we've just been scratching the surface. I mean, we've looked at nine. We're going to extend our scope um, into the next few years. We're going to look at many more sites across the state and undertake a similar program where we go out, we sample, we assay, we look at the mineral chemistry and we figure out if there's potential there. So if there is potential for remining and reprocessing to recover some of these critical metals or new economy metals, then the idea would be to undertake novel metallurgical testing. So. I guess one thing to think about is when you're dealing with mine waste materials, you're dealing with materials that are partially weathered. So in order to, I guess, improve metallurgical recovery, you know, there'll have to be a process of potentially cleaning surfaces. So this kind of leads to a whole new stream of, I guess, metallurgical innovation as well. So it's been great to work with um, Helen and some of the other mining companies in the state to actually start um, going down that process of actually identifying um, what sort of metallurgical techniques would be relevant to, to actually extract the value from these sort of untapped resources as it were. So lots to do. And I think there's been a lot of enthusiasm to do it, which has been great. So, I mean, uh, I've already said it a few times, but as we're sort of seeing new students come through and um, they've kind of got more of a green focus than they have in, in previous years. So, you know, we're getting new geoscientists coming through who have kind of got that strong green flavor that are keen to, to sort of look at mine waste in this manner and reduce, I guess, the environmental footprint of mining. So exciting times. Great. Well, thanks very much, Anita. Um, and so that's that's really covered the first kind of set of questions I wanted to pose to each of you. And so we can now, um, if if we have any questions from the audience, then then we can certainly um, um, then we can certainly address them. So again, please please type your question into the uh, into the chat if you have it. And while we're waiting for questions, um, I was going to come back to Dan. Um, I wanted to pick up on one thing you said, which was that, and I've experienced this myself, having been involved in junior companies for a long time. That that um, you know, sometimes investors are sometimes the ducks are quacking for one thing, and sometimes the ducks are quacking for something else. And and it is um, you know, it is sometimes challenging to to um, to maintain investor excitement about an area. And and you you actually said that there was a bit of fatigue around Hammer's efforts in the Mount Isa region but my impression was that that um, even though there may be some fatigue from investors that there's no uh, that there uh, that your work has really only scratched the surface so I'd be interested to hear your comments on that yeah it's it's an interesting one um, so for people's background I was with Samfire Resources before I joined Hammer so um, my efforts with Samfire were looking for global opportunities in the base metal sector. And one of the reasons I joined Hammer was their portfolio that they had in Mount Isa. Um, I saw great potential in what we had there. Um, and I think I shared the view of uh, people like Russell and Mark and Ziggy who see tremendous opportunity um, for exploration through there. Um, our position in Mount Isa uh, was developed over the six years. We've changed from when we first started in Mount Isa six years ago. We've added tenements, we've added projects that haven't been touched for 10 or 15 years. I think within our umbrella, we have 400,000 400, tonnes of copper equivalent within the portfolio. Um, these sorts of projects and opportunities aren't available in many places globally. And um, while those projects may not be economic today, um, they will be economic in the future. 
and we can massively change the story of what we're doing in Mount Isa through a bit of exploration success. I, I touched on us drilling at the end of the week. We're drilling an opportunity there, and I, I heard everything that Stephen said, and there is tremendous opportunity undercover. The project we're drilling at Shadow is outcropping mineralisation that hasn't never seen a drill hold into it. Um, it's a very large breccia unit. It's never been recognised as a potential IOCG deposit. Um, and we, we regularly rock chipped great grades of copper and gold through there. So those are the types of opportunities that still exist in Queensland. And um, some of these projects just haven't been touched by modern exploration. And I think um, as soon as we, there is a little bit of success in Queensland, I think we'll see a bit of a rush into the region, much like we've seen through the rest of Australia, where there's been a bit of a renaissance through a number of different regions through some exploration success. Great, thanks. And we've had a question come through and it's actually for you. So I'll stick with you for a second, Dan. Uh, what do you think you need from government and academic groups to help you with your exploration pro projects? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I get asked quite often for a little bit of input, both from, from Helen and the team and also from um, the likes of AMEC. And it's, it's, it's a hard one, um, a small team, uh, lots, lots on the go. Um, I think the CEIs are fantastic. I couldn't be more um, complimentary of the CEI program in Queensland. Um, I think the number of applications I've seen through that process, I think demonstrates how valuable industry sees that. And I think to move along some of these projects without requiring fundraising events from shareholders, especially in difficult times, I think is really important. The data sharing, um, I think some of the programs and the Helen and the team are looking at through reanalysis of old, old cores, old rock chips, seeing what sort of results uh, within portfolios existing as a way that new discoveries can be made. And I think some of those efforts are fantastic. Um, we welcome them. Uh, we're looking forward to, to being involved in many of them in the years to come. So I think, I think the government's on the right track there. And I think it's well recognised in the number of people now that are, are looking towards these programs for, for some assistance. Great. Thanks, Dan. Well, I might actually pass to Helen that because that, now that we're on the CEI, subject, um, I noticed that there was an announce, a recent announcement that the, the amount of funding for the current CEI programs and CEI programs going forward has actually been increased. And so I'd be interested to ask your sort of feelings or perspective on, on how important you think that is um, in, in, the, in, in the government's thinking going forward. Sure, uh, and first, thanks. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate all those comments and as always um, your support and Hannah's support um, in the things that we try and do. So yeah, Rick, the, the CEI, the Collaborative Exploration Initiative, which is Queensland's um, version of a, a co-funded drilling program or a, a government funded drilling program for industry, um, is has last November, we announced another four rounds under the New Economy Minerals Initiative um, and that was three and a half million towards the CEI over those four years. And then recently as a, um, as a stimulus measure in recognition of the importance of the resource sector to a COVID recovery, um, we, our minister announced last week, I think it was, uh, another $10 million towards CEI over those same four years. So we will be boosting the CEI program by two and a half million per year over those four years. And, and we had also announced bringing the, the remaining four years on the initial funding forward to this year as a stimulus measure. So it means that the upcoming round, um, which then the, the successful applicants of that will be announced uh, in mid to late July, the assessments going on at the moment, that'll be around $5 million to, um, to be able to put towards the exploration sector um, for this coming 12 months, which I think is fantastic and it's so necessary. Um, juniors in particular, you know, it's, it's a constant battle um, to raise money just to drill even a couple of holes and the amount of energy and the, the cost to the company just in terms of time and salaries just to even go through those capital raising processes is, is also really expensive. So um, within the Queensland government, we had made the decision to make our grants program, uh, to remove the need for co-funding in our grants program so that there is no onus on a company to have to go out and raise 
the other half of the funds to be able to do the drilling. It's a direct funding program because we just, all we want to see is whether it's holes in the ground, reanalysis of old core, a new geophysical survey. We just want to see things happening. And the whole purpose is to stimulate exploration and keep the thing, keep the, keep the fires burning, so to speak, no matter what the um, economic environment is. And, and by, um, by removing the need for companies to, to go and raise money in order to be able to do that in the first place. It's, it's not a top up, it's a direct grant. So I think that's, that's what sets us apart. And I think it's really important to the now and into the future as, as the economy recovers. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so we've had another question come through and this one's for Steve. Um, and that is innovative exploration technologies or it's around innovative exploration technologies. Do you think machine learning and artificial intelligence will be used and more accepted in exploration in the future? Oh, absolutely. Well, not just in the future, but it is happening now. And it's happening on two fronts. I mean, Helen, Helen's department are driving the adaptation of machine learning on, on the data that they collect from the industry and, and, and nationally through national surveys. And that's a really promising development. And then obviously within in-house, um, it major, many of the major companies uh, are, are actively hiring and using uh, deep learning and machine learning experts to, to drive um, all aspects of the, of, the, of the value chain, not just exploration, but also mining related applications. And in Queensland in particular, there's, there's a lot of um, startups and entrepreneurs who maybe that's where the, the questions come from. But, um, you know, there's a lot of really promising dynamic companies out there who are offering services that, that can assist us. I think, you know, in, in the question you originally asked me, Rick, uh, and I was, I was, I focused on the undercover air opportunities that are out there. Um, the one thing we can't afford to do going into the future is bump hunting. We can't afford to find a mag anomaly and just drill it. We need to understand the geology from the geophysics and machine learning can really assist with that. But also machine learning does better in environments which where there's rich data. And that's where someone like Dan and Hammer Metals come in, you know, where you have an amazing plethora of data that's available in the Mount Isa inline exposed regions. And you can use techniques like machine, various types of machine learning and deep learning to, to assist you either in interpretation of the geology or in some cases in, in direct targeting approaches. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna to pass to Anita for another question now. Uh, must we, oh yes, we have one. Um, so this is a question, well, it says it's for Rick and Anita, but because I'm, I'm not answering questions today, I'm gonna to give it to Anita. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on the kind of technologies or on these kinds of technologies taking over the role of people in mining and exploration? What's the impact of this on, on sustainability? Wow, that's a big question. So feel free, Rick, if you want to join join in on this one, because I know you've recently undertaken a, a bit of an evaluation in this space. Um, I mean, obviously, there's great opportunity to reduce um, risk, uh, personal risks, if, um, if there's more automation, that's, that's for sure. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of technological innovation could really change the way that we manage mining. I mean, you know, for example, you know, if we think if we think actually about, I mean, I was, I was in a, a meeting earlier today, we were talking about sort of different ways in which we could handle and process tailings. I mean, I guess we have to think about how we can challenge the conventions. So, I mean, if you were conveying tailings, for example, is there something you could do in that process of conveying that, um, that could actually undertake some of the metallurgical processing, for example? So um, that probably doesn't really answer your question, Rick, sorry. Um, but I mean, in terms of just reducing human risk, um, you know, uh, risks to, to, to workers, there's obviously a great deal of opportunity there to, to use new technologies. Um, in terms of, I mean, I'm going to speak back to what Steve was talking about in terms of machine learning. I mean, looking at data sets around um, mine waste management, you know, with a bit more software development and a bit more machine learning in that space, um, there is obviously a lot of opportunity to improve the way that we undertake environmental management and construct our waste landforms. So, 
Yeah. And also, also monitor our, our wastelands too. Thanks, thanks, Anita. I'm just going to interrupt you there because I think Sorry. we've got about 10 seconds left. So thank you very much, everyone, for covering exploration on land, undercover, through the government, on waste. Um, it's been a it's been a great.